긍정심리학, 창의력과 상상력, 지능검사, 학습장에 애 대해서 알아보도록 하겠습니다. 스카페리 카우프만 박사님은 어린이 시절 학습장애 진단을 받았지만 불가능은 없다를 몸소 보여주고 있는 분이십니다. 현재 미국 펜실베니아 대학교에 있는 긍정심리학센터의 상상력 연구소의 과학 부문 책임자입니다. 현재 상상력과 창의성과 놀이에 관련된 연구를 진행하고 계시고요. 크리에이티비티 포스트의 공동 창립자이며 The Psychology Podcast의 진행자이십니다. 최근에 Nature Scientific Reports의 공동 연구 학술 논문을 실리셨고요. 예일대학교에서 인지심리학으로 박사 학위를 받으셨습니다. 한국에 소개된 책으로는 Ungifted, 불가능을 이겨낸 아이들이 있습니다. 중국어로 번역이 돼서 중국에도 소개될 예정이고요. 그리고 넷플릭스의 브레인 게임즈에서 시즌2 에피소드 10에 나오셨는데요. 저는 개인적으로 재밌게 봤습니다. 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. <웃음> Part 1 Yes or No 많은 한국의 부모님들이 웩슬러 지능 검사가 가장 믿을 만하다고 생각하고 있는 것 같아요. 이게 사실인가요? 아니면 거짓인가요? Yes or no? So it really depends on what we mean by reliable. The Wexler test is uh, considered one of the hallmark IQ tests that's been used for the past hundred years or so. You, know, you have the Wexler, you have the Stanford Binet, right? You have um, the Woodcock Johnson test. So you have, a, you have a bunch of contemporary IQ tests. I would say all of them, all contemporary IQ tests, or the the ones that are most widely administered, um, are grounded in the latest way of thinking. So it really depends a lot on what kind of information you're trying to get out of the child. If you want to assess particular abilities, so you can give that child very specific recommendations on how they can achieve or flourish in their school system, I would recommend the cross battery approach. Where you don't just take, you know, one of these tests, mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, the Weschler, the Stanford Binet, whatever, mm -hmm. but you pick and choose different subtests across these different batteries to really inform the decision you're trying to make. 부모님들이 아이들의 장점과 약점을 파악하기 위해서 지능 검사를 자주 해야 할 필요가 있다. Yes or no? I don't think that every single child needs to take an IQ test. If it looks like a student is struggling in a classroom in a particular area, like maybe reading comprehension or math class, mm -hmm. something like that, and they require additional resources, mm -hmm. the way the school system is set up is often you have to refer the child, and then they require the use of a battery of IQ tests. I don't think that these IQ tests should ever be used in isolation of other forms of information. Mm -hmm. You know, they shouldn't be the sole data point. I do think it is valuable if a student is looks like they're falling between the cracks to use some of that information, but certainly by no means should it be used as its only source of information. 상상력과 창의력은 다른 개념이다. Yes or no? So I think imagination is a crucial part of creativity, but it's not the same thing. So no, <laughs> not the same thing, right? So imagination, you know, is something is is having. Uh, mental visions or representation of things that don't currently exist to the present senses. Um, but that could be lots of things. That could be like, oh, well, I'm imagining what I had for breakfast last yesterday, or I'm imagining my future self. But that's not necessarily creative. A lot of people in the field of creativity do view creativity as novelty and usefulness. So something that serve some sort of function that, that is useful to others. People with schizophrenia, for instance, they have quite an amazing imagination, you know, especially those who are suffering from psychotic delusions. Um, but some of it doesn't make sense, won't make sense to other people. And, uh, and some people in the creativity field argue that's not really creative. So imagination is necessary, but not sufficient for creativity. Daydreaming, 백일몽은 현실적인 사람은 하지 않는 유치한 행동이다. Yes or no? No! <laughs> daydreaming is just because a lot of children daydream doesn't mean it's childish to daydream. Um, it means that children are smarter is what it means. <laughs> um, as we get older, we our, uh, our capacity and our, our motivation to daydream really decreases quite dramatically. And it's often because of the, the schools that uh, don't encourage it. But we should encourage it. You know, a lot of the latest research on the science of daydreaming shows that when you go into your in internal, what, what William James would call the internal stream of consciousness, that we can go in, inward 
and really um, focus on our inner dreams and fantasies and future strivings, we actually can increase the chances that we will someday reach those goals because it's really valuable to have a really good image of your future and, and to make some sort of sense of your current environment. If all, of our, if all we're doing every single day is focusing our attention simply on the world external to us, you know, we're never going to bring in our, our own unique, uh, what's called the imagination brain network, and make a connection to that outer world. And it's really that connection between the inner outer world that is the source of compassion, uh, deep learning, not just fast learning, like standardized test learning, but deep learning and creativity. 박사님은 긍정심리학 센터에서 긍정심리학을 가르치고 계신데요. 제 생각에는 박사님이 무척 긍정적이실 것 같아요. 그래서 드리는 질문인데요. 정신분열증조차 긍정적인 면이 있다. Yes or no? Maybe. <laughs> Schizophrenia is a very uh, debilitating illness and I don't want to romanticize it in any way. People who have full-on psychotic episodes it is very scary. But I will say that schizotypy, yes, could be. Schizotypy is a form of schizophrenia. Um, well, it's not a form, it's, it's a personality trait that, that all of us are somewhere in schizotypy. It's like schizophrenia light, so to speak. You know, you could take a schizotypy test, I could take it, and I show you where you are. And it includes magical thinking, it includes um, something called apopenia, um, your ability to. Uh, not, you know, your tendency to see patterns in nature and the world that don't necessarily exist, but the truth is they could exist. So apopenia is, has been linked in, in recent years to creativity in the sense that people that are very open to lots of different connections and things that aren't obvious to others, um, some of those connections do turn out to be pretty creative. But I would say that um, you have to be careful about you know, what language you use. Schizophrenia it's, has a very specific meaning within the clinical literature, and I would say schizophrenia um, is, is not going to be very conducive to creativity because it's, um, you'll be spending so much of your time trying to overcome you know, your daily adaptive living. And, but milder forms of it, you can take bits and pieces of it, as you see in the relatives of those, those with schizophrenia, and you see that there are elements of schizophrenia that are um, uh, very adaptive in a non-clinical setting. But they have re they've done research where they've looked in the brains um, brain activity of people who are trying to solve be really creative, and uh, you know maybe come up with like how many uses for a brick are there or something like that, or imagine unconventional uses for something, and um, they have that creativity rated. And they had people who scored very high in schizotypy take these tests, and what you find is both those with high schizotypy and those who had really creative answers but don't you necessarily have schizotypy showed very similar brain activations in what's there called the precuneus, which is one of my favorite brain areas, is the precuneus. It's part of the brain that deals with your consciousness, your inner stream of consciousness, your, um, your, your daydreaming. Edgar Allan Poe had a great quote about, you know, that, that the really creative geniuses are those that can dream by day, you know, and are cognizant of the great secret, you know. And in a lot of ways, this research is showing that Schizotypy, the schizotypal mind and the creative mind have common out commonalities in that they can keep their their night dreams or their inner consciousness on call, so to speak. You know, like a beeper, beep, beep, you know, on call all throughout the day as they're experiencing the world, so that they can increase the chances that they'll make some sort of unique connection between the inner and outer world. Because, like I said earlier, creativity really lies in that space where there's a connection between those two worlds. Part two. Intelligence and creativity. 지능과 창의성. 박사님은 인간 지능을 연구하기 위해서 인생을 바치셨는데요. 그리고 박사님의 책 Ungifted를 통해서도 지능을 재정의 하셨고요. 지능이 도대체 뭘 말하는 거예요? You know, my whole life I've been fascinated by the question was intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, as a young kid, I was personally very interested in that question because I was treated as though I was not very smart, you know, due to having a auditory learning disability. And I wondered, you know, what is it that these kids that we single out as smart have that I don't have or that... What I kind of realized is that there really are different ways of being smart. You know, the IQ type of way is a way that, you know, it's meaningful and means something. You know, those who are very good at IQ tests do seem to have very good working memory. Mm -hmm. They're good at able, um, at abstract reasoning, and uh, they're, they're good at, like, reading comprehension and visual spatial rotation, things like that, on the spot, fluid intelligence. But I don't think that's the only way of being smart. So we can call that general intelligence, 
But in my book, I propose something called personal intelligence, which I think is very much neglected. So you have a unique package of characteristics and behaviors. So do I. Everyone does. And it's being able to bring that to the table and mix and match it in unique ways to allow your, you know, device strategies. You might face obstacles in their life. An IQ test doesn't, doesn't measure your ability to have resiliency or devise alternative strategies or have that perseverance, you know. But personal intelligence, my theory of personal intelligence allows for those kind of characteristics like motivation and grit and inspiration to play a, a pivotal role in helping you get to your personal goals. So I define, in my book, I define personal intelligence as the dynamic interplay of abilities and engagement in the pursuit of personal goals. I really want to bring the person and individual back into the picture as opposed to uh, theories of intelligence over the past hundred years that have focused so much on comparing one person to another. So, um, based on your own intelligence definition, your IQ score went up. Up the roof. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's one of those things that um, a lot of people will say, then what does it mean to have a low personal intelligence score? Mm. It's really not the spirit upon which I've created the theory of personal intelligence. Mm -hmm. I'm not obsessed with how to measure personal intelligence. I'm much more interested in how to recognize that everyone has a personal intelligence and help nurture it. You know, we, I think educators can get too stuck in needing to measure everything and quantify everything. Mm -hmm. And they forget how important it is to actually draw forth what's already within people um, by inspiring them, by um, listening to their dreams. Like, I, I think in a lot of ways, sometimes just listening to a child's dreams can be more important than measuring mm -hmm. their IQ or measuring, you know, their so-called intelligence. So, I love Mini Kitty. Oh. Oh. Do you think you can understand Mini Kitty's language? I really want to know what she dreams about, so she's going to tell you. Hmm. What does she mean? She wants to be a pop music star. Ooh. <laughs> she wants to be a big 80s, you know, rocker, you know, in front of a sing, sing in front of a big stage, uh, in front of like thousands and thousands of cheering fans, so she wants to play guitar. I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. 제가 박사님 책을 읽으면서 특히 마음이 아팠던 부분이 아 oh, 세상에 나는 다른 애들보다 너무 뒤쳐져 있다라고 깨닫는 순간과 영재 교육의 비공식 학생이 되었던 것이거든요. 박사님 어린 시절 학습장의 진단을 받고 특수 교육을 받았던 경험을 소개해 주세요. When I was uh, very young, for the first couple of years of my life, I had so many ear infections that it was very hard for me to process the teachers in teaching in real time. So I fell behind in the school system, and, and once you start falling behind, the, the gap just widens very quickly. And I was I was kept in in not gifted, I was kept in special education, the opposite of gifted education, for um for for quite a long time, uh, up till ninth grade. Um, but there was this teacher who really inspired me, who pulled me aside and asked me, you know, saw my frustration, so thought I was capable of more, and said, why are you still here? And I said, you know, that's a good question. I've, I've been wondering that myself. And so I um, was really inspired to take myself out and try to challenge myself to see what I was capable of achieving. And I did. I, I got out of special education at the beginning of high school um, and signed up for as many courses as I possibly could sign up for to see what I was capable of achieving. And... Um, something that really clicked is I joined the high school orchestra, and my grandfather was a cellist in the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he taught me how to play cello. Um, I have the same cello I played in my high school right there, <laughs> and um, uh, I I seemed to be pretty good at, at cello, and I uh, got accepted into a uh, music school, uh, or a music program at a school, and I uh, did not accept get accepted to the psychology program at that school, um, but I was still determined to study psychology, so I transferred into psychology once I got there and um, and haven't looked back since. That's it in a nutshell, but there's so much more to the story, which you can read in. Paksan님은 그럼 어린 시절에 받았던 학습장의 진단은 오진이었다고 생각하세요? 아니면 박사님이 학습 장애를 극복했다고 생각하세요? I don't think it was a misdiagnosis. I think that I probably had central auditory processing disorder, which is what it was diagnosed. But I think that what a lot of people don't recognize is that 
A learning disability is really just a specific learning disability. You can have a specific learning disability, but you could also have tremendous abilities in other areas. Mm. It's not either either you're learning disabled or you're gifted or you're this or that. You know these these categories don't define a whole human being. You know each person is a very complex system of cognitive, emotional, personality, mm. you know processes, things like that. So I think that I probably did. I think I um, learned to compensate for it so well throughout the course of my life that that has no effect, as far as I can tell, on, on my life. You know, I'm, I'm hearing your questions pretty well, and I can respond in process. Even if it takes me like 300 extra milliseconds to process um, auditory input, you know, it really has not affected my life as much as maybe some people think that it should. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, there's, but there's, you know, my story is just one of so many people with dyslexia, people with autism, you know, people just they have these very unique minds and ways of processing the world or hearing the world or seeing the world that they get uh, perceived in a certain way because of that, that label, but people don't really see the person themselves. They just see the label, and that's really problematic. You know, I think, I think people are capable of a lot more uh, than we give them credit for. So I think many parents are, many Korean parents at least, they're very reluctant to bring their children to the hospital or the mental institution. Because they are afraid of that kind of label. Because people just see the labels yes. and they don't, they are just defined already. That's very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there um, places, are there special schools like private schools and things like that nature in, in Korea? Because there are in America where um, if, if your child has certain orienting disabilities or, 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 or is, uh, would benefit from more advanced resources, uh, are rich resources that there are private schools and there are, you know, like Montessori. I love Montessori schools. You know, certain schools where those labels are not really used. Um, mm -hmm. I do understand the realities of the public school system in in, mm -hmm. in America and probably in mm -hmm. Korea as well. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think t parents are are well within their rights to uh, be concerned that that their student will be labeled. But you know, ultimately, it's good if a child is struggling to, to get the help that they need, but to instill in that child a strong sense of self-advocacy and um, self-efficacy and confidence um, and, and really understand, you know, parents, sometimes parents can be the best educators of the child, you know, and, and talking to the child and telling them about, you know, this is what this means and this doesn't mean you're stupid and this doesn't, you know, don't, you know, don't listen to other people. And I think the more, uh, the more you can really instill that in the child and still get them the resources they need to thrive um, the better. 박사님이 어린 시절 지능 검사를 받았을 때그 IQ 검사 해 주셨던 분이 어 너는 굉장히 창의적이구나라는 말을 해 주셨다고 해요. 지능과 창의성은 반대 개념인가요? It's a really interesting question. You're not just asking me are they different, but you're saying can they be opposites? Wow. Well, I do think that if we it, again it depends on what kind of intelligence we're talking about. Talking about general intelligence, like IQ type intelligence, um, which is really good at, you know, the skill set of, of determining what is in the world, you know, learning what is and um, understanding, comprehending, perceiving. Sometimes that can get in the way of creativity, which is really producing something that could be, or seeing a vision, you know, having that imagination, which is a crucial part of creativity, of what could be. And sometimes you get too distracted by what is that you really don't see um, what could be. And, um, and therefore, that would limit your creativity. So I think it, could, it is possible for the two to be opposites. Part three. Positive psychology, 긍정 심리학. 왜 사람들이 긍정 심리학적 접근 방식을 이해하는 게 중요한가요? Yeah, positive psychology is a relatively new field within mm -hmm. psychology that focuses on strengths and kind of nurturing what's best within us each of us, you know, and trying to bring that and bring that out and as opposed to just focusing on remediating weaknesses. Positive psychologists have uh, have come up with this insight that I think is an important insight is that, you know, if you have depression or you have, you know, suffering from anxiety, things of that nature and that's like negative ten and you get therapy and, and they help you with that, that maybe gets you to zero, but doesn't get you to to human flourishing. Flourishing is going from like zero to like fifty. What can we do to help people um, flourish. And I think that a lot of parents are going to be very interested in helping their child not just remediate issues of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but actually having that child have a great sense of well-being 
how that child have a great sense of engagement in their environment, positive social relationships, a flow, the sort of flow state, you know, where they're really um, absorbed and interested in a task. These sorts of senses, deeper senses of well-being, I think a lot of parents will um, would be very interested in cultivating as much, probably more so, than just standardized test performance. I agree, but many Korean parents are, are interested in nurture children's creativity, imagination, and their own learning, but they stop doing that when their kids get to be uh, middle school students because now, okay, reality, you have to go to a good college and to get accepted to a nice college, you have to focus on this and this and this. So the reality doesn't support. Screw reality. The reality <laughs> is that um, it's not either or. It's not that you either have to choose well-being or you have to choose good test performance. They really go hand in hand. A child that is um, feels like they belong, feels secure in their learning environment, um, has positive social relationships, has encouragement, um, has um, is motivated to learn the material. All those things are going to be crucial for increasing the chances that child is going to learn that material and remember that material mm -hmm. in the long term. So I think that you don't have to choose one or the other. My optimal education paradigm is one that um, we're, we're both coal-esque. I have one more question. Yes. So what is daydreaming? You know, daydreaming is kind of a catch-all phrase for lots of different processes that involve your going inward, going into, inward to your own inner strivings and dreams and really getting in touch with your inner monologue. All of us have an inner monologue. We really don't listen to it that much, you know. There's some mindfulness techniques can really get you in touch with that inner monologue. But the more, you know, but, but really daydreaming is a way of representing what kind of mental cognition is happening when we turn inward and we block out the external world and we get in touch with like I said, you know, our, um, our future strivings and all our unresolved issues and really listen to that inner voice. I think one of the key aspects of, of really inspiring children and really seeing what they're capable of is to truly listen to those dreams that they have and give them and encourage them to, to dream and to express how they're feeling about their school and about their education system. We undervalue the importance of being in, in the education process and um, we have lots of notions of, of human potential and, and intelligence that, that just stifle children or just hold them back from, from what they can really achieve. So I would say that, you know, you as um, a friend, as a, a parent, as a teacher, whatever role you have where you're in contact with children is um, you really can influence them and help them in, in ways that you don't, that you probably didn't even realize. So, so have you been to Korea? No! I, didn't, I would like to go. Like to go. <laughs> Do you think Koreans would like me? Are you kidding me? They would love you. Yeah, After right. this interview comes out, will you inter may organize a talk? I'll come to Korea. <laughs> I'd like to say, yeah. thank you for um, uh, your interest in my work. Um, you know, I think that together we can really uh, make a change if, every, if everyone all around this world wakes up in a way to the realities of how children develop. We start to really see children for who they are. Yeah, I really want to try Korean food. I want to do karaoke. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I want to like, uh, yeah, I want to go to the like night dance, dance clubs. Club. Oh yes, oh yes.